there's two things that I really love to do. I love fishing and I love hunting. Unfortunately, I'm not good at either one of those things, but I still enjoy giving it a good shot. So if it's a nice Friday evening or Saturday morning, I go out fishing, you know, hit the water, drop a line in, what's probably going to happen is I'm going to sit there for a few hours and I'm never going to get a bite. So what I want to talk about this morning is somebody who had a similar day to me. Dropped their nets in the water, but didn't catch a single fish. The only difference between my experience and their experience was that they were a professional fisher. They didn't catch anything. And I'm just an amateur. Luke chapter 5. Starting in verse 1, I'd like to read verse 1 through 11 of Luke chapter 5. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake Genesaret, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were, fishing, and were washing their nets. And then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, and they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the great catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now on you will catch men. So when they had brought the boats to land, they forsook and followed him. Luke's account of Jesus' calling for his first disciples is unique among all the Gospel accounts. While Matthew and Mark record an account of Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee and abruptly calling Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John to follow him, only Luke shares an account of such a miraculous catch. Peter and the other fishermen had hoped that they would accumulate a profitable catch for the night. After all, this was their livelihood and this was what they became dependent on. So this was a very part, a vital part of their life. It was their job. If they caught fish, then they made money, and if they made money, they were able to provide for themselves. With no fish, they had no reward. But things don't always work out as we think. Though they fished all night, their nets came up empty time and time again. Finally, after the best time of fishing came and went, they headed for shore, clearly disappointed and tired. This situation kind of reminds me of a story of a young boy. There was this boy who wanted a bicycle for a really long time. And there are the, these auctions that would happen regularly, and some bicycles would be auctioned off. And it was one of the boy's greatest desires to buy a bike and take it home. In a way, he's a lot like these fishermen. He expected to get a bike whenever he would go, and the disciples expected to get a large load of fish. We all face situations in our lives that we simply just cannot control. Sometimes there are certain aspects of a situation that we can control, but often we run into situations that really don't care about what our opinion is. They're beyond our control. And these men were having a similar situation while in the boat trying to catch fish and provide for themselves. So I want to look more at what we see from this passage here. First, we see an anticipation. They expected to catch fish. They had every reason to anticipate success. They were professional fishermen. This is what they did for a living. If your job is, let's say, farming, are you going to be optimistic and hope and expect a good crop for the season? Of course. They had the right equipment. They were fishing during the desired time for the fish when they are most active. And they had more patience than I could have asked for to stick out there all night, expecting that at some point the next pulling of the nets would be profitable. 
I imagine, I'm sure it's not how this went, but if I were Peter, you know, when I start reeling in my line and I feel something, you know, given resistance, I get really excited, like, oh my god, I got a fish, finally, and it turns out just be a stick. And sometimes I kind of imagine if that was uh, the excitement at first when there was a little bit of uh, weight upon the net, but then just turned out to be all the leaves and the sticks from the lake. Probably not, but that's how I envision everything while I read it. But every one of us has expectations in life. I think I've come to the conclusion, to the conclusion that sometimes I can be overly optimistic. Uh, my expectations never fail to exceed reality. Never fail. And so I, I get myself into some disappointment sometimes because I think uh, the situation is going to be greater than it actually is. But our expectations are sometimes unrealistic. Some people expect their family life to be like the Brady Bunch. Some expect the world to provide them with everything they want. Some expect the other people around them to do everything for them. Some expect to sail through school and college real easy and become a millionaire in a year. I've got some classmates like that. Some expect to earn their salvation just by being a good person. And some expect to get what they want when they want it, solely on the reason that they want it. But there is a problem with focusing too much on our expectations. To focus primarily on our expectations has a tendency to make us have to deal with a lot of unnecessary disappointment when our expectations fail. This happens to me every Saturday during the fall, because Friday night, I can't sleep, because I'm too excited about going hunting in the morning, and I sit in my bed all night dreaming of this big 10-point buck that's going to magically appear 20 yards broadside from my stand. And then nothing shows up. And I walk back through the woods all disappointed. Dad's like, how'd it go? I saw a squirrel. That's about it. Focusing too much on our expectations can cause us to forget responsibilities to something that we may need to do. Another hunting story of me being, it was opening day, and I was focusing so much on what, what could possibly walk into my area. And I focused so much on that all night that I forgot a vital piece of equipment that I needed. Once I actually got a deer, I forgot my deer tag. Because I was focusing too much and was too excited on the expectations that I had set place for myself that I forgot to make sure I had everything I needed. And focusing too much on our expectations can make us become more selfish. The more we let into our expectations, the more we fantasize on what could happen, and then all of a sudden, we want that opportunity more than we want someone else to have our opportunity, so we purposely drive others away from such a possibility. These men that we read about fish for a living, not being able to catch any fish was a pretty big problem for them. One thing we realize, however, is that God likes to use these problems as part of his plan. So we know the setting from verse 2 that these men were washing their nets. This had been after their long night of fishing. This is when Jesus comes along. Jesus purposely gets into that boat that belonged to Simon Peter. Verse 3 implies that there is at least one other boat. But why did he get into Peter's boat? Jesus got into the boat of Simon Peter because unknown to Peter at the time, Jesus had a plan. And there is a plan for all of us too. Times of trouble or crisis like, like this may not always seem like it. But there is always an opportunity. The fishermen expected to catch some fish. There is nothing unrealistic about this expectation. There is nothing unholy about this expectation. There is nothing unworthy about that expectation. But it was, for that day, out of reach. The boy that I talked about saved as much money as he could and was very eager to hopefully spend it on a bicycle at the auction. So every time the auctioneer started the bid for the bike, the boy raised his hand and would say, I bid one dollar. 
The bidding would unfortunately rise higher and higher out of the boy's price range. Each time the boy would bid one dollar, but every time somebody would outbid him. Each time the boy's disappointment grew. He sort of like these fishermen. They were very optimistic about a good catch, but as they pulled empty nets over and over, their disappointment increased. They had expectations. But what more can we learn from this text? We see the disappointment that we talked about. They pulled empty nets. Each time they pulled the nets up, they were empty. Their discouragement deepened and their expectations shrinked. Sometimes our highest expectations take the deepest of plunges. Our realities fall far short of our objectives. Our anticipations fail us. Our nets come out of the water empty. We may try humbly and very hard to reconcile with someone and they refuse our efforts. Our nets came up empty and we were disappointed. We may work very hard to please someone in our lives, but our actions come unappreciated. Our nets came up empty and we are disappointed. We may stay up late, open the books from cover to cover, and still not make the honor roll or make a good grade on the test. Our nets came up empty and we are disappointed. Dealing with disappointment in our lives is something that we will always have to deal with. Like the fishermen, sometimes we pull an empty net no matter how hard we may try. We suffer disappointment and stress, but it wasn't the final word for the fishermen. And disappointment doesn't have to be the end of the story for us. The little boy began to think that disappointment was all he was going to have. As bike after bike sold to the highest bidder. As the last bike was being sold, brought forward, the little boy, again raising his hand, said, I bid one dollar. The figures in the bidding rose a few dollars, and the auctioneer finally closed the bidding at twelve dollars. You know what you're thinking? Twelve dollars for a bicycle? That is a steal. And he said, sold to the little boy in the front row. Now, the auctioneer reached into his pocket, grabbed eleven dollars, and laid it on the counter. The little boy came up, put his dollar and pennies and nickels right beside it. The boy then took his new bike and headed for the door. Just when the fishermen thought that their nice labor was for nothing, and Peter felt very discouraged, Jesus stepped in and made the difference. In effect, he laid his $11 alongside Peter's boy. So we see Jesus executes a miracle. During his ministry on earth, Jesus performed many miracles, which included healing the sick, raising from the dead. The Bible describes uh, more than one miracle of Jesus involving fishing. And in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is sitting in a boat, talking to the people on the shore of the sea. And he instructs Peter to take the boat further into the lake. As we know, the net went into the water, and all of a sudden, it implies it was not much time after lowering it, that they caught a large amount of fish, a, such a big amount of fish that the nets began to break. An interesting thing here is that some people who try to dismiss the miracles of Jesus suggest that there is no miracle performed by Jesus here, but rather that Jesus just saw where all the fish were, and Peter did not. But if that was true, why wouldn't have Peter have seen them? Why wouldn't these professional fishermen who go out here probably multiple times a week, if not every day, know where to find the fish? Jesus was not just trying to provide for their pocketbook. He had a better idea in mind, a greater purpose. Jesus wanted to show these men the power that he had. So that and have these men follow him as a result of the power and what Jesus had done for them. <clears throat> Jesus still provides for us. He has performed miracles in times past. But we need to be aware of some things. Jesus is not some type of vending machine who you come to only in a time of desperation and insert your coins of prayer. We have to stay with Jesus and continue to follow him, not just in times of need. 
We need to pray and have a connection with Him. He has promised to meet our needs and to give us what we need beyond our capacity. Philippians 4 verse 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to the riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Those promises, however, are spoken to those who are faithful. He does provide for the lost by giving them the word of God and how to come to him and follow him. But his promises of eternal life are for the following, the people following Christ. When we come up short, when we cast out our, out our nets and come up empty, he is there to provide for us. The auctioneer, motivated by kindness and sympathy, provided for the young boy. He added his $11 to the boy's one and allowed him to buy the bike. Nothing could have made the boy happier than to buy his own bicycle. As the boy was going away with his bike, he realized what the man had done. He laid the bike down, ran back to the auctioneer, gave him a big hug, and cried. When Peter realized what had happened and saw the great quantity of fish, he was amazed, humbled, and grateful. And finally, we see a surrender. Peter exhibited a proper response. We know what happens next. The nets so full of fish that they begin to uh, break the boat so full of fish that they begin to sink. Seeing what was happening, Simon Peter is overwhelmed with a mix of emotions. Should he be afraid or should he be amazed? But he is sensing that he is in the midst of some great power. Once Peter realizes this, he responds by falling down at the knees of Jesus and saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He immediately realizes who is before him. Simon Peter is very much caught in surprise in the moment. After all, who wouldn't be? In the process of his regular everyday grind, and turns out it was a particularly lousy night of work as they caught nothing, he's encountered by one who can change everything about his name. While he stands in amazement by the power of the one before him, he is immediately aware of his spiritual condition. He sees the overwhelming disparity between what he has done and the position that he is in and what Jesus can do for him. When Peter realized what had happened, when he recognized the quantity of the fish. When he understood the miraculous nature of the event, he responded. Peter's humility grew out, in a, grew out of an awareness that Jesus did indeed know what he was talking about, though Peter at first had doubted him. When he says, launch out to the deep and let down, let down your nets for a launch, and Peter first doubts him by saying, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Peter's humility grew out of an awareness that this catch of fish was no fluke, or just a lucky guess by a carpenter who wasn't a fisherman. And Peter's humility grew out of, the, out of an awareness that Jesus is worthy of being followed, Jesus is worthy of being served, and Jesus is worthy of being obeyed. Peter was blessed and made a proper response. The other fishermen recognized the blessing and did the same. When Jesus blesses you, what is your reply to him? How do you respond to his work in your life? Do you think that he owes you? Do you think you deserved it? Do you take it for granted? I know I have. Do you see it as the hand of the Almighty turned in your favor? Do you realize what he has done for you? In the final analysis, there are only two responses that Jesus will recognize. To resist him or yield to him. Which one is for you? So there's many lessons that we can learn from this passage of Scripture. Some of them are there is failure without him. To work without him will bring disappointment. To work without him will bring discouragement. 
We're told in Ecclesiastes that life apart from God is meaningless. I've said this many times before. We often have this idea of the grass is always greener on the other side. That being, if I just had more money, my life would be better. If I had more of this, my life would be better. But a man, Solomon, had all the power and wealth and knowledge that he could have. And he set out to try to find the meaning of life. This man saw the grass on the other side. And he comes to the conclusion at the end of the book, as he wrote along his process, he wrote that all is vanity in grasping for the wind. And at the end of Ecclesiastes, he comes to a conclusion for the meaning of life. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Without God, life is meaningless, and there is failure without them. And we must have faith in him. We should have faith that he is the God of creation. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. We should have faith that he is the God of creation, and we should have faith that he is a caring God. Deuteronomy 31, verses 7 through 8 then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to, to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. And we should leave all behind for him. Luke 14, verse 33 says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot become my disciple. This involves surrendering all to him. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And this involves submission. James 4 and verse 7. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Without God, there will be failure. So we must have faith in him. We must leave all the worldly pleasures behind for him. And we must follow him completely. He will lead us as the good shepherd he is. And he will lead us by his word to an eternal life with him. If we will obey what he commands. Follow God and he will guide you through. We're given with a choice at the end in our lives. Obey God or resist God or follow him. By resisting God, we get nothing out of it and end up in a life. At the end, when our life is over, we take our final breath. We will have to suffer eternity in torment. But if we follow God, let him guide us with his word. When we take our final breath in life, we will go to a place much better than this. No tears, no pain, no sorrow. We're left with that choice. Whatever You're free to make the choice what you want, but for me... I want to follow God. As Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and sing the song of invitation. If there are any here this morning who have not yet been baptized and would like to take that step and do so this morning and continue to follow Jesus on your journey, then we encourage you to do so. If you have been baptized, but if you have fallen back to your former ways of sin, we are not here to judge you. We are here like Jesus to have compassion on the sinner and try to we'll be here for you. We will pray with you and help you along in your daily walk with Christ. Whatever needs you may have, please make it known for it's everlastingly too late. And let us stand while we sing.